Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between your school and Design Deluxe Podcast. Our guest today is Keith Kids. Welcome, Keith. Happy to be here. Nice uh, to see you again. Nice to have you. Great to see you. So tell us about you and your work. So I am, as you said, Keith Kitts. I am the program director for the master's program here at Suffolk University. You're, you're joining us at 9 a.m. in Boston on a Friday morning. And uh, again, I'm happy to be here. Uh, also, I'm an assistant uh, professor here in graphic design. So I not only work with students on the master's side of our program, but I also work with students on our undergraduate side. I'm primarily working with students who are uh, you know, kind of getting ready to move into the career space. So I'm working with our seniors in our, what we call our GD3 and GD4 studios. So that's essentially senior thesis year. And I'm also working with our master's students who are in our thesis program. So we have three modules in our thesis. We have a research semester, we have a studio semester, and we have a documentation semester, which essentially becomes the portion of how they're wrapping everything up how they're distilling everything into final deliverables and how they're uh, producing some type of exhibition of that work. So it's a, it's a really exciting cohort of students to be working with. Uh, I love working with them from the standpoint of getting them ready for next steps. Um, I always felt when I especially left my undergrad program that I felt a little sort of underprepared, like I didn't have my sea legs per se, and uh, so I'm very happy to be the person who they're kind of checking in with right before they, you know, leave the nest and go out into the real world. So it's, uh, it's exciting. It's uh, at times very daunting because there's a lot of stress and they feel a lot of pressure, um, but it's, it's good. And it's, uh, I find it incredibly rewarding. I always tell people that it's uh, the most wonderfully exhausting work I have ever done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, on other sides of my life, so I also run a professional practice. Uh, I think it's very important as an educator to have work that's professional facing. Um, so I tend to work with clients uh, primarily in the branding area. So I'm working with them from the standpoint of strategy and then visual development for their brand. Uh, I tend to work with uh, clients that are in like the startup space. So they're just getting things going. Uh, getting new businesses going, maybe transitioning from one business to another. I like this kind of work because I really enjoy helping people to identify their visual needs and to help them wrap all of that into some brand dress. Beyond that aspect of things, I also have an aspect of, of my creative life where I am a, a visual maker from uh, more of this intersection between graphic design and uh, visual art. Uh, I started my career in the visual world as a painter and as a sculptor, and I still use the, all of those techniques in uh, daily poster making. I've been doing this daily poster making process since uh, 2014. It's a project that I refer to as the 365 project because I make a poster, sometimes more than one, every day, and I've been doing this uh, since that first year of 2014. And it's a matter of, I think we're in year eight or heading into year nine. Um, and I just find it to be like my daily calisthenics or my Zen space or my meditation space. Uh, and it's also something that has taken my work all over the world. I've had uh, shows or been involved in shows in 54 countries now. My goal is to exhibit in every country, which, you know, we'll see if that happens, but it's a goal. It's good to have goals. Fantastic. So tell us about the work you're doing right now. Is, is there any uh, project, any research work that you're, that you're involved sure. with? Sure. So I, the projects that I'm doing right now, I'm working right now with a client in the uh, retail space. So they are a client that is uh, a cold press juicery. So I'm working to help them to develop a brand. Uh, we have the beginnings of that complete. Now we're working on some packaging and labeling uh, and potentially some uh, brand dress that would go into a physical uh, brick and mortar location. So that's one thing that's on the horizon. 
Uh, another thing that's on the horizon is right in front of me right now, taped up on my wall, is an exhibition that I am currently curating, a solo exhibition that will happen in Turkey uh, later this year. Oh, fantastic. Which part of Turkey? Um, that's a good question. Not one that I can answer at the moment, because this email came through uh, maybe two days ago, and it's a matter of like, I've been really rushing to get this going. Fantastic. Tell us, you tell us, tell us about it after, after the podcast. Wonderful. So you're very busy in this healthy combination of practice and, uh, and teaching. I, I hope so. I like to think it is. Um, I think students uh, tend to see that I am very active in the field and that I'm active in a very multidisciplinary way. And I think it shows them that they can use all the things that are inside of them and they don't have to just kind of be a web designer. They don't have to just be a branding designer, that they can be lots of different things. I always refer to design as this very vast spectrum, and we can find all different ways that things can fit on it, from performance to things like application design and everything in between. Absolutely, absolutely. So how did you get into teaching? It's, uh, it's been a long path. So I finished my initial degree, I would say, I think it was in 1995, and I went right into industry and worked in industry for many years, uh, worked in small boutique firms, uh, collaborated with small firms, worked in the corporate realm as a creative director for about 11 years for a very large uh, national, now international HR firm, uh, and really started to feel kind of burnt out and feel like it was just kind of like doing the same things and running on the same sort of hamster wheel and uh, really wanted to be, you know, moving into a space that was going to be more me. So I started my own practice in uh, 20, 2009, 2010, and that started to ramp up, but there's always been this sort of ache inside of me to want to teach. Uh, I had a, uh, I've had an exceptional life filled with great teachers, starting with my parents and my grandparents and a really great creative uncle uh, and seeing all these people and observing all these people and, and seeing the things that they could do and make was always very interesting to me. I've always been someone who's been highly curious and someone who's highly observational. I like to see how things work. I like to know how things work. And then I like to participate in them. Uh, I've also been really blessed with having a long life full of teachers in my educational path. So I always credit when anyone talks to me about teaching, I always credit my want for teaching being my fourth grade teacher, Jay Williams, who was my language arts teacher when I was in fourth grade. And the way that he taught was so compelling to me and so interesting to me. I thought, man, I wanna do that someday. He had such a way of connecting with students. He was incredibly empathetic. Um, I remember him you know, vividly listening to some of you know, our long-winded stories as fourth graders that probably weren't all that interesting to him, but it was like we were the only people in the room. And, you know, then after him, I had a, just, again, a, a long line of wonderful people who were uh, really great modeling for me. I always talk to my colleagues and to students about how we're all modeling behavior for someone. And, you know, people are constantly observing what we're doing and how we're doing it. And especially in the professional space, it's so important to be a positive role model as an educator. So I have just, again, been really benef benefited greatly from having so many of those people in my life. Fantastic. So what, what, was, what was your first sort of start in, into, into, into teaching? So I, I moved to Boston to get my master's degree and immediately sort of like, you know, get to Boston, get the apartment, get enrolled in classes. And the first day of classes, I basically met with everyone in my program and told them, you know, I'm here to become a teacher, help me become a teacher. And I had uh, one 
particular instructor there, Richard Doubleday, who was very uh, helpful in saying, you know, come to any class, observe any class, be involved in critiques. Uh, he was very instrumental in helping me get involved with Suffolk because he was also teaching at Suffolk at the time as an adjunct. Uh, he invited me to come in to critiques here. Uh, our former director of this program, Rita Daly, also invited me many, many times to come here. So I just really used the time in my two-year master's program to just do a deep dive in being in educational spaces. So going to lectures, again, listening to people, listening to podcasts about education, really paying very close attention to how people were delivering content. Again, looking for the models that I needed to help me to, to basically learn how to teach. Uh, and then I think we all of the, all of us who work in the field, who work with clients, we're in some capacity teaching. So I think all of my years and years of working in the, the field have helped me from that standpoint as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. So how do you see right now the, the environment for helping students um, make a start in the professional environment? How, how can we best help students? I think that uh, it's, it's certainly a challenging time. It's certainly a challenging job market here in the US. Um, I really work to help students to start earlier rather than later in their search and in their process. Uh, I have uh, embedded in all the classes that I teach uh, a requirement that they do informational interviews. Mm -hmm. Students are very uh, sort of shy about networking and networking is challenging. It's not something that I think comes natural to most of us. Uh, students are very a surprise to hear that I, I think of myself as being an introvert. And, you know, I, I am happy to not be in front of an audience. I'm happy to be, you know, in my studio working in a solitary space. Uh, but this is a field that's social and we have to connect with people. We have to be willing to talk. We have to be willing to do things that we're uncomfortable with. I tell them all the time that the most learning comes from when you're in a state of fear or discomfort. That's when you learn the most. It's you learn the most about yourself. You learn the most about whatever it is that you're producing. So helping them to get more comfortable, helping them to understand the value of their voice as a designer, helping them to get uh, more comfortable interfacing with the world at large, I think is is really important. Hmm. And would you say that uh, things have changed with the, the remote work or uh, the difficulties? Well, I think we were remote for about a year and a half. We're currently back on campus. Uh, we're in a all vaccinated state and everybody's, you know, tested that uh, needs to be and we're masked and we're social distanced. So I think that we're in a uh, a pretty comfortable setting and I am happy to be back in person. But I will say that I don't think that we really kind of missed a beat in the graphic design curriculum from the standpoint of a lot of the work that I do is not here in Boston. So I'm doing interfaces like this all the time with clients. So helping them to understand that, you know, Zoom or Skype or Google chat or FaceTime, like these are all tools, just like Illustrator is a tool or InDesign is a tool. Uh, I think that the students that were engaged with that very quickly and realized that this was just another interface. I mean, sure, being in a, in a room together is very different, but we just kind of you know leaned into it. And it is one of these things where design is always about the pivot and getting them to understand that this will happen in client projects as well. You know, I have certainly had things that have been on press or even things that have been published digitally that's like, oh, we have to pull that down because the CEO has decided that they want to change or tweak something. Um, or we have to pull it off press because, you know, there's a photo that somebody doesn't like the, their expression and they want to change it. Um, so that happens in the real world. So again, it's that matter of being uh, able to adjust I think was something that was really helpful for us. I actually uh, felt much more 
empathy and much more sympathy for my colleagues in like the fine arts, because mm. it's very hard to teach things like painting and sculpture this way. Yeah, I mean, for us designers, remote work was second nature. We were doing it for decades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like <laughs> remote working. I'm not. I'm. I'm talking more about the fact that, um, for example, apprenticeships or right now, you know, are yeah, also I think, can be I think, remote and it's sort of more challenging in a way. Yeah, I think it's challenging from the standpoint of the mentorship aspect of it. From the standpoint of uh, actually doing the work, connecting with the work, connecting with an opportunity, that actually has probably been uh, in some ways a good thing because it's allowed students in our program to work in New York or work in LA, but they're still here in Boston. Of course. And, you know, we, especially on the graduate side, we, we're a very short streamlined uh, MA, we're not an MFA, so we're a very short streamlined program. We're two years maximum for students who are coming in with a non-visual background. We're a year and one semester for those who have a visual background. So it's kind of uh, challenging sometimes to find an elective space to do an internship and get it to you know line up perfectly with their needs in other parts of the program. But with it being remote, it was kind of able to kind of fit into schedules differently. And also, again, the opportunities just opened up because it wasn't a matter of like, there's a heavy concentration of design programs here in Boston. So there's a lot of students that are vying for the same jobs in the same you know metro area. When we broaden that to the whole country or maybe even internationally, there's a lot more opportunities. Of course, absolutely, absolutely. So. If you had a magic wand that you could change anything about uh, design education, what would you do differently? Would you would you uh, change anything? <laughs> um, less bureaucracy. Mm. I think every educator says that. You know, we we want the autonomy to be able to do the things that we need to do inside of our classrooms. Um, it would be great to have maybe a few less meetings. Uh, as again, as a director of the program, I love my role as a director, but there's a, a not a lot of time. You know, there's like, I teach uh, this semester, I'm teaching three courses, and then I have uh, committees that I'm on. I have responsibilities for things like advising, curricular development, and curricular uh, modifications and uh, monitoring. And then like a million meetings. So there are days where it's a matter of like any of that sort of time between classes is just so full that getting getting to class is oftentimes a relief because it's like, wow, now I get to do what I'm here to do. Absolutely, absolutely. How can our viewers and listeners best find you? So I am available uh, primarily on the Facebook platform. So you can find me very easily there, uh, you know, facebook.com backslash Keith Kitts. Uh, my, I'm not, you know, locked or private. So it's very easy to find me there. Uh, certainly you can find me through the Suffolk website as well. Fantastic. Any advice you'd like to leave us with? I am always very concerned about educators being able to help students overcome fear. So anything that we can continue to do to really promote empathy, anything that we can do to really help uh, students feel better prepared, uh, to make sure that they're seen inside of a program. I think oftentimes students uh, will feel that, that you know they're not visible and they really struggle. This uh, I, I am very empathetic toward this generation. I think this generation is dealing with a lot of challenges that I did not deal with growing up. So it is one of those things where anything that we can do to continue to foster empathy toward them and be supportive of them and just let them know that you know we are here to advocate for them is key. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. pleasure. Keep in touch with uh, what we're doing and I uh, hope to see you soon again. Certainly. I'm a big fan of your podcast. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye.